Hello and welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, licensed professional counselor. In today's episode, I'm going to be talking to Joelle Prevost about chronic illness and how to work through it. She is a registered clinical counselor in British Columbia, Canada, and she is the author of another book called The Conversation Guide, How to Skillfully Communicate, Set Boundaries, and Be Understood. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about her upcoming book, which is Managing Personal, Emotional, and Social Aspects of Chronic Illness, a workbook. This book is still in progress, but should be available by the end of 2023. You can, of course, follow Joelle Provo at her websites, which will be in the show notes, and you can find out when her book is arriving. I do believe you are going to love this interview, as Joelle is just such a thoughtful and creative person with a huge heart for helping people suffering from any sort of issue, whether it be a mental illness, a chronic physical illness, or people going through relationship issues, and more, as you can find out on her website. And we really discuss so many intricacies of dealing with chronic illness, from the person who is dealing with it, and all of the things that can happen because of that, as well as their friends and family. All right, let's get to the interview. Welcoming back to the Intentional Clinician Podcast, Joelle Provo. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me back. Absolutely. And we first talked in episode 82 about your book, The Conversation Guide, How to Skillfully Communicate, Set Boundaries, and Be Understood. And I got a lot of feedback on this one because I titled the episode, How to Have Conversations Without Having Your Reality Invalidated or Imposing Your Reality onto Someone Else. And I thought that seemed quite provocative and people um, really responded to it. So I'm excited to kind of like follow up on that with part two because you're writing another book right now which i think people will find useful and i'm glad to have this conversation so uh yeah welcome and uh we're in two different countries right now um Mm -hmm. and uh, you're in canada i'm in the u.s and we're gonna chat about your forthcoming workbook so do you want to tell us a little bit about that and then we'll jump into it yeah definitely well i'm really excited about this one. Uh, Just like my last book kind of came to me in a similar way where with the conversation guide, I was having a lot of conversations uh, with clients and talking to clients and teaching them these communication skills. And I wanted to point them to some sort of resource that just had a really easy step-by-step protocol that they could follow to have difficult conversations, set boundaries, things like that. Found that a big theme that a lot of people were struggling with. And I found myself just repeating myself a lot in in session. And so I kept trying to find a, a book that had just a really easy, straightforward layout not laid down by a lot of theory and and things like that. And I couldn't really find one that um, I thought was, you know, kind of, again, this just step-by-step protocol. So I made that conversation guide book to just help my clients and hopefully other people as well structure those conversations and just, again, have a guidebook um, to reference at any point they need. So in my work, I also work a lot with one of my specialties is helping people manage chronic illness and the social and emotional aspects of that. So again, I'm finding myself noticing a lot of themes, having the same types of conversations, teaching the same skills to a lot of clients and thought, you know what, especially with chronic illness, there are a lot of people who can't access counseling for whatever reason. So I wanted to make a workbook just with all the things I've compiled over the last few years of really specializing in chronic illness uh, counseling. And so, yeah, I've kind of got all this pile of stuff. I'm hoping the book will be out by the end of the calendar year and I'll probably price it very low because I just want people to be able to use it and have it again as a resource for my clients and hopefully helping other people as well. 
I think that sounds like a wonderful project. And a little bit about your background was in the bio. We talked about your registered clinical counselor in British Columbia, and you work a lot with different folks. And now, you know, the conversation was the first one, and I loved how practical it was, and I was reading through it. But uh, this workbook is, you know, for folks who are dealing with chronic illness, um, all mm-hmm. sorts of chronic illness. And I think it sounds yeah. like, you know, you're you're trying to figure it says personal, emotional, and social aspects and, and trying to work mm-hmm. on a workbook. So can you tell me a little bit about how did you become interested in helping people with chronic illnesses or how that happened and maybe a little about what you've learned from working with them? Because every therapist I know who's really good, and I know um, you are in that category, really learns from their clients. So uh, what what do you feel like you've kind of learned and how did that happen? Yeah, great question. So my journey uh, with chronic illness started well before I was a counselor when I was in my early 20s. And I got diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, which is an autoimmune disease that affects the large intestine. Similar to Crohn's disease, it's kind of under the umbrella of inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. So I have a personal connection with living with chronic illness and experienced before I had all the tools as a counselor, what it was like living with chronic illness, what it was like having flare ups, how that affected me, not only physically, but again, emotionally, mentally, socially. So I have this kind of firsthand account with it and have done all sorts of things in my life, where whether it's been, you know, medication, uh, changes in lifestyle, stress management, changes, huge changes in my diet, uh, all of these things. And just and living with chronic illness, it kind of colors how you live your life and every decision that you make, right? It becomes this lens through which you see the world. And so having that lived experience, I think has been really helpful in being able to empathize and have compassion for my clients with chronic illness even if they have, you know, different illness or different symptoms, and a lot of these general themes I've seen are quite similar. And then I got my counseling degree. And while I was doing my master's program, a friend of mine who is a, also a counselor and was already a counselor at the time who happens to have Crohn's disease was putting together a group therapy session for people with IBD. And so I got to join that as a student and help develop that program. It was a five session set. We ran it out of uh, a hospital in downtown Vancouver and we got people in with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis to come in and learn more emotional and stress and social management skills. So this is things like self-advocacy, like basic CBT skills, um, visualizations for stress management, and pain management. And so being able to teach these just kind of basic foundational skills was really great. One really interesting thing that I learned from that experience too was a few of the people brought their partners to these sessions. And it seemed like the partners almost got more than the people with the illness. They were able to hear the stories of people with IBD who weren't their partners. And I think it just helped really open their eyes to see all sorts of different struggles and symptoms and things like that, and really understand these diseases a lot better. And so that was a really great piece of that. And I've kind of brought that again into this this workbook that I'm, I'm creating, that this isn't just for people living with chronic illness, it's also for their partners, their friends, their family. If you know someone that's chronically ill, if you go through this workbook, hopefully that becomes very insightful for you as well to get a bit more of insight on just the minute to minute struggle that living with chronic illness sometimes is. And so, yeah, that's kind of been been my journey. And then, you know, as a counselor, the last handful of years, just really getting to talk to a lot of clients about 
a lot of different chronic illnesses. I know way more about the ins and outs of a lot of really rare and specific diseases. Um, also some really common ones. And we've got a lot of people who are clients with ulcerative colitis, um, but again, a huge range of you know, diabetes, MS, PODs, um, chronic fatigue, endometriosis. Like there's so many things. Chronic health issues are obviously on the rise right now. And uh, yeah, glad that people are seeking help, but it it seems like there's again, a bit of a hole in, in this area of providing support for not just the physical side, right? But everything else that comes up. So, and hence the workbook. What a very good summary. And I was thinking about uh, this was uh, part of, what struck me was the the family members. And I, I'd heard somebody say a quote one time about if you find a person going through a crisis or through through an illness, like remember to always ask the family members if they're okay, because it, it while it's affecting the person terribly, the person in crisis, or in this sense, a chronic illness, they're affected. Mm-hmm. The ripple effect is that it's also affecting anybody that they're close with, right? So such as a partner or a family member or whatever, they have possibly adapted to helping them, which might put stress on them, or they're kind of riding the roller coaster of what's going on with the chronic illness. And and I think learning those skills and learning how to work together is a key in helping the person with the chronic illness, but also their family members to be able to kind of help understand it so there's not so many disagreements and and maybe issues around it, you know, resentments or frustrations. And I think like becoming a team is so key, obviously going back to your first book, communication, um, you know, and, and the hard part is there's lots of hard parts, but one of the hard parts I think about is just how do you have a unit of people that can cohesively communicate about this when not everyone is feeling the same way right like yeah like like hey good morning it's a it's the morning let's <laughs> all you know and if somebody has chronic illness that affects their mornings right it's like no this is not good morning it'll be good afternoon when i can get myself together but right now mm-hmm. it's not a good morning and how does that how do we translate that so i wanted to delve in a little bit unless you got comments on that just about some of the things you found that were helping your clients but from your perspective sure. but 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 it, it, i feel like i was kind of just commenting on what you said but you can feel free to comment further if you'd like well sure i think um this book so far how i have it laid out um first is a bit about self-exploration which we can get back to and then emotional processing and working with emotions that come up But then the third part is, yeah, social life. And I think you touched on a lot of great things there as far as communicating how you feel. A lot of these chronic illnesses are invisible. Mm -hmm. And that makes it extremely difficult for the people who are experiencing them to relate to other people and explain what's going on. And that can be very exhausting. And it can there's all sorts of things that create resistance and blocks and that as well as there's can be pressure from family members and friends and partners who of course care and love these people a lot and want them to feel better it can be really horrible to tell them you don't feel well and see how disappointed they might be and see how sad that makes them and so managing chronic illness can be extremely lonely due to this. Sometimes we don't want to tell people how we're doing, right? Because we feel like we're going to let them down or we're just too tired and we don't want to. So there's all sorts of things with definitely just communication of of symptoms and health, but there's also a lot there too with like boundary setting, managing expectations of people. Like, can I do this social event? Can I not? I might not know till last minute right? Can I, and a lot of things coming up too, especially in romantic partnerships with feelings of guilt, like people entering relationships, right? Under the, the understanding that they are healthy. And then X amount of time later, someone becomes ill. Well, then there's this whole thing of, 
I feel really bad that I've pulled this person into this lifestyle that they didn't choose and they don't necessarily have to deal with, but they do because they're with me. And there's just a whole lot to social dynamics when chronic illness comes in. And so people managing chronic illness, again, are not just dealing with the physical side of things. They are trying to manage all of these communication and social aspects of it. And it can be just extremely overwhelming. And a lot of people, again, don't have the skills. And so they just isolate and they shut down. And then we see super high depression rates in people with chronic illness because they're completely alone and they feel like no one understands them. And and it's it can be a very, very yeah, isolating, lonely place to be. So hopefully, hopefully some of these things in this book can just help people at least get a little bit of a, a start in getting through that loneliness and reconnecting and communicating with other people and and managing the social aspects but yeah also the emotional pieces like i have in my emotional section just deconstructing anxiety anger loneliness guilt grief all of these things really coming up a lot um in a chronic illness so that is wonderful that you're providing this. I, I have to say my own personal experience with chronic illness, um, well, not personal, I guess, anecdotal experience as a clinician is that oftentimes it makes everything else worse in the person's life. And then mm-hmm. it like, and then you have like seven or six different realms of like decompensation from previous functioning levels. So it's like mm-hmm. they start out with chronic fatigue or something like that. Right. And then that leads to depression and then that leads to anxiety and then that leads to their relationship being a mess. And then their job is mad at them because they're like, well, I don't see chronic fatigue on your blood tests. And maybe you just have major depression. And, uh, you know, and then you've got the uh, the family not understanding or, um, you know, not being able to make social events. Like you said, like they can't come to a birthday party. They won't know at the last minute. How rude is that to miss my birthday party? Like all these sort of assumptions people make when, you know, versus if you're missing a leg. I think people can go, oh, they're missing a leg. Like, clearly, it's going to take them longer to get here. They have to have a special car. They might have special workplace accommodations. And and so I think that people take it personally sometimes when somebody has a chronic illness that can't be, like, visually seen. Same as mental illness, right? But chronic illness is the hard part with that is what we're seeing is chronic means it's continuous, right? With with, with mental illness, like, somebody can say, hey, I'm going through a depression. I had a traumatic incident. I have a level of anxiety right now because of uh, finances. Like, I'm just giving a little break here. All the expectations on me, I will get through this. Yeah. So I'm wondering, my big question here is, you seem to be, I don't know your personal life, but you seem to have a job and write books and things like you're somehow managing this, right? So I'm wondering if if you have hope for people with chronic illness because I almost feel like they have to have a higher skill set than your average person who's healthy. So it's like, okay, you're already suffering, but now you need a higher skill set with social, emotional, and personal issues Mm -hmm. to be able not only to navigate your illness, but to navigate everything surrounding the illness. So do you have hope that people can maybe get help either through therapy and reading books to actually possibly become higher functioning in certain areas unrelated to the thing they can't control being the chronic illness. Right. That's my question, like about, you know, mental health and friends and jobs and things like that. What are your thoughts? I mean, obviously this is a very general question. You can kind of answer it however you want. Well, I think that can be one of the silver linings of having chronic illness. Um, And I see so many of my clients are just such amazing people that I absolutely adore um, that they have been able to, yeah, create the self-awareness, create these communication skills and boundaries and learn all of these things, right? Use the resources that they have. So, and become, yeah, usually a lot more self-aware than maybe the average person because they've had to, right? They're a lot more in tune with their body usually, yeah, because they've had to. And so there can be, I've got these little sections at the end of the workbook that I'm playing around with. One of them is called, if you need validation, and it talks just all about how it's super unfair to be chronically ill. And 
it's okay to be angry. And if you're frustrated with people around you or if you're lonely, but then there's also a section called, if you need some optimism. And again, this talks about all of the amazing things that being chronically ill can actually give us. Right. And I think from my example, yeah, I've been able to use my experience to better connect with my clients. And that is invaluable. Right. And yeah, be able to help people hopefully too. And so I think there can be a lot of silver linings to it, but to that point too, it's, it's still management. It's never getting better. And you made a great point, chronic illness, right? It's chronic. It's forever. Even if we're in remission, it's not gone. There's always a chance it could come back. And so it's not like, hey, I broke my arm and now it's not broken anymore, right? It's more like your example of like missing a limb or something that is forever. So the acceptance piece of that is again very nuanced. And I go into that in the book. And what is acceptance versus what is giving up versus what? Because sometimes, again, pressure from people who aren't chronically ill don't understand and the very <laughs> nuanced difference in that and see that when people are accepting their illness, they're still managing it, but they've understood, understand the fact that they're not going to get better. They can feel better and they can manage things well, but the illness isn't going to go away. And sometimes there's that pressure to like cure yourself or be healthy again, or again, get better. And that can be really tough to manage. And so that's a big piece to wrap, wrap our heads around. And uh, yeah, because living with this, to your point before too, I, I like that. Um, yeah, it kind of just exacerbates everything in life. And I noticed that kind of with the pandemic, you know, people were asking me, oh man, how are your, how are your clients doing? Or I bet business is, is really busy in the pandemic. And I, I was like, not a lot of my clients are talking to me about the pandemic, but the issues they had before are just all worse. Like if they had anxiety, it's worse now. If they had depression, it's worse now. If they had relationship issues, they're worse now. If, so all of these things kind of get again, exacerbated by these um, conditions. And so that can be, again, quite similar to chronic illness. And I think living through the pandemic was a little bit like dealing with chronic illness too, because it was like, oh, now we're all in a really unpredictable state. What's going to happen? We don't know. What are the rules here? We don't know. We're feeling very powerless. We're feeling very not in control. We're feeling very helpless. Some people actually did get very sick too. We don't know if we're maybe going to get very sick and how sick and what that means. And so I think the pandemic was a great little window into seeing what actually it's like living with chronic illness too, in a lot of ways. So as horrible as the pandemic was, again, maybe a bit of a silver lining in, in that it can give people some, some more empathy and compassion for those with with chronic illness, because that's basically a lot of what it's like. Yeah, that sounds very difficult. Like all the things you just discussed could not knowing having to deal with it day in and day out. I could see that making a lot of the any sort of mental symptoms you have, such as anxiety or depression, worse. Right. And mm -hmm. and just, you know, I thought about this with uh, type one diabetes. Um, mm -hmm. I can't like name names. So I'll just say anecdotally, I know people with this and I, I can't help but think, my God, I'm actually impressed at how well they're doing. Because if I mm -hmm. had type one diabetes and I had to give myself insulin yeah. every day and have some sort of thing inserted into my body, I feel like, first of all, it's kind of depressing because like your lifespan's already cut, you know, a little bit, most likely mm -hmm. number two, that's reality. Number two, like 
it's almost like re-traumatization. Like if you have a good in your dream body, you're probably not injecting yourself with insulin. Not all the time. I'm the nightmares, right? Yeah. But then you wake up and you got this insulin pump in you. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, like my body doesn't function correctly. My pancreas and whatever else, mm-hmm. you know, is involved in this process isn't working. Like that's traumatizing. Is something wrong with me? Am I, am I karmically cursed? Like there's all these thoughts that could kind of come off of that. So I think, you know, diabetes is a little bit more apparent, right? Because you have to like do something every time you eat and monitor your blood sugar and all that. But um, it's a lot of these, like you said, are invisible, right? Like, like what you were talking, ulcer of colitis, like, um, you know, these sort of things, uh, you know, Crohn's, somebody might just go to the bathroom more and then that could be a source of shame, you know, if they're having to go to the bathroom and have to prepare around that. So I think about these sort of things. And I think that's where it's hard, a big part to bring the partners and families into it and maybe get them involved in these books is having that compassion, having Mm -hmm. empathy, and then the communication of how do we work together on this is, I think, a huge point because I could see, you know, family members getting tired of helping, right? I mean, they get tired. Oh, I thought this, you know, it's like, we think there'll be that that's the acceptance versus giving up, right? Like, Mm -hmm. are you giving up? Can't you get better? Right. And, and I think that we all like want people to get better, right? That's a positive, but at the same time, there's certain things that your body is now in homeostasis dealing with this disease. So like, uh, the best that we can have is remission, right? Which can last for, I mean, I've heard of people being in remission, not from diabetes, but from uh, other chronic illnesses for like five, six years, right? And which is amazing. Like that that's how much health work they did. And then something happened like stress-wise and the body just went right back into that um, pattern of illness. Um, I don't know why I'm not, you know, this is pretty beyond us. A lot of chronic illness is difficult to understand why. Um, why it does what it does um, in terms of why does it, why does it come back at certain times? I don't, obviously we know what it does, but like, why does it come back? Why does it go away in terms of the remission factor? So the acceptance versus giving up. And I, I want to throw, I'm going to throw a little wrench into this conversation because in the U S you may not know this. I'm not sure what Canada's like, but in the U S when people become disabled, in certain ways and cannot work they have to try to apply for social security disability which is Mm -hmm. when you're older when you're over 65 or 67 in the u.s you get social security for like being an old person who could retire or have a supplemental income so we give you money back some of it's based on what you earn some of it's based on just like a minimum anyway but you get like money in the mail. So it's like, oh, good. I don't have to work as much or not at all. Right. But if you are disabled and and cannot work, you have to apply to be disabled and you're literally labeled disabled. And then you get like this minimum or medium amount of money in the mail, which isn't honestly, I don't even think you can rent an apartment on it. It's pretty bad. Like you'd have to rent like a room and then get on food stamps and then maybe so it's like, I think it, last I knew it was like 660, like a month, which is, I'm sure that was like 10 years ago. So I don't know what it is now, but not enough to like rent like a little bedroom somewhere maybe. And then like food stamps might help you get up to a thousand dollars a month so you can actually eat and live yeah. somewhere. But I thought about that and the mentality between acceptance and giving up. So in one way I have to convince and I have to accept that I'm chronically ill. I have mm-hmm. to try to work so much so that it doesn't work. So then if it doesn't work, then I have to somehow get the effort involved to get a lawyer and go before a judge and show them how much I'm disabled and convince them I'm disabled. But then they're going to say, well, why don't you just become a telemarketer or something like that? Right. Cause they can say that, right. You have to try telemarketing or some other vocation and then we'll consider your case again in six months. Right. Or whatever. So it's this whole issue. So then when you get labeled disabled, then what if your chronic illness goes into remission? You know, it's this whole, it's this, it's, it's a weird thing here in the U S it's like yeah. black or white. It's like one, you're either, you're either functioning and we expect you to work all these hours to earn your rent and your food money, or you're disabled. And now we're seeing, you know, you're kind of like thrown out of society in a way, you know, like you, you're, mm-hmm. you're poor, you're automatically poor yeah. and people view you differently. And, and, and some people do. So th- like, 
I, I'm sorry to throw in those complexities, but I was thinking about your idea of like actively accepting that I have something so I can work on it versus giving mm-hmm. up. And But yet in the U.S., you almost have to declare that you've given up trying to earn the disability label mm-hmm. to make sure you're not homeless. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, I don't know what your yeah. thoughts are on that. So I think as far as giving up, I mean, giving up to me would mean just not trying to feel better or manage in any way. It would just be living life without chronic illness in mind. Whereas I think accepting actually can be a part of doing things like applying for disability. And we do have that in Canada. It's a little bit different because we do have free healthcare here, which is very nice. Um, So, but people on disability, we have short-term disability, long-term, they get very, very little money. Uh, barely livable, like you said, maybe could rent something, probably not. A lot of the people that I see who are on disability live with family members. You can't get ahead. You also, you can work, but only a certain amount. You can't make more than a certain amount of money or else they will stop your disability. You can't have certain assets. There are a lot of restrictions to life. Like you have to be this sick. And if you're well enough to do X, Y, and Z, then you don't get the disability anymore. So there's not a lot of wiggle room. And, you know, it's it's unfortunate that systems are, are like this. And I think they're like this, unfortunately, because, you know, the government has only so much money and maybe they're, they're worried about people taking advantage of it, which again, fair enough. But I think there could be systems put in place to be a lot more empathetic and compassionate and check up on people and see them as individuals and do this more on a case by case basis where you said too, being more flexible. And this would obviously be a way more complicated system, (laughs) which, you know, I don't know too much about the government and and how it works and all that, but it could be a lot better. Um, I think it could be a lot worse though, too. Like I'm very happy to live in a country that does at least have that as an option for people that there is disability, you know, payments and, and things to do, but yeah, it's a huge pain to get it. Um, and, and the money is, is very, very small. Um, and again, very, then puts a huge amount of restriction on people's lifestyles. So yeah, that adds a whole other issue to again, being chronically ill. If you're that ill that you can't work, then you have to deal with all of this and deal with living below the poverty line. And that is just going to create more stress and more isolation and all of these things that are just going to usually make chronic illness worse. So it's very frustrating, but your piece about maybe accepting when it comes to bringing this into a piece of identity, I have a lot of a big section early on in my workbook about that and have done a lot of work with my clients around identity and how does chronic illness fit into your identity and a lot of times people right yeah can want to push back on accepting that this is part of who they are and they do things like not take their medication not take care of themselves do these things kind of again psychologically to like push back on that right they don't want to be seen as a sick person they don't communicate how they're feeling to anyone around them they are just kind of ignoring this and hopefully it'll go away or not be as big right i don't want this to be a part of me makes a lot of sense working through that identity aspect is a big piece of acceptance and i have in my identity exercise in the book too looking at our identity as a whole, like who are we? What makes up who we are? What piece of the pie are we okay with our chronic illness taking up? What are the other pieces of the pie? Can they be maybe taken away by chronic illness too? You see a lot of people put a lot of their identity in their work. Well, if Mm -hmm. you're too sick to work and that goes away, who are you? And I've seen that happen a lot, especially with people who are very sick that keep working when they probably shouldn't and they should be resting and taking care of themselves, but they don't know what they would do with themselves or who they are outside of their job. So that's very scary. So this one, spoiler alert, this in this one exercise in the workbook, we kind of 
decode those different pieces of identity of which are fixed and which are fluid and which could maybe be a bit more precarious given being chronically ill and which will you always have like i will always be someone's daughter someone's sister you know someone who loves animals someone who loves helping people but i may not always be a counselor i may not always be a couple other things right if i get super sick or maybe just other things happen right those parts of my identity are a bit more fluid and so being able to really see that in a tangible way on like a worksheet can hopefully provide a lot of insight into people accepting okay chronic illness is this part of my identity my identity is also made up of all these other aspects some of those aspects may change but some of them i'll always have and i need to nurture all these parts of myself because and life is unpredictable especially when you're chronically ill and so knowing who you are and knowing kind of your identity and values can just make all the difference and not feeling so just caught off guard and swept off your feet when something you know health wise happens that is very wise. I'm glad you shared a little spoiler from the book, one of your exercises. <laughs> uh, well, you an overview of the exercise. And I, I do think that's important because I, I have run across the same thing because people, whether or not we have to, whatever work we do and whatever hobbies we do or whatever, I think people grow quite attached to that. You know, it's, it's what you mm-hmm. spend a lot of your time doing, right? And it's something that's concrete, right? It's like, I have become a pipe fitter and I am really good at that and I can help people's homes and I can do this and that. And then without that pipe fitting, like we, we become attached to that. Do I, how do, like you said, I'm someone's daughter. I'm someone. So how do, how, how do I cultivate that? I have to cultivate that because I put so much stock into this thing I'm doing and the thing gives me money, right? Being a lover mm-hmm. of animals, which I am does not give me money. It takes money from me, right? Like it's a, it's a, and and it's like, it's, it's, I think it's hard in the Western world because one of the things, if you go to a a, a mixer, quote unquote, I guess they call them, I don't know what you guys call them, but like networking meetings, young urban professionals, whatever, go to the library and have a cool meeting. People say, Oh, what do you do? What do you do? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's that question. um, Instead of like, I don't know. I don't, I've never lived in a, you know, like a Buddhist centric culture. So I have no idea if they say like, how are you being today? Like, I don't know if they say that, but, but like, <laughs> what do you do? Well, and I've, I've talked to young adults who've had problems with chronic illness and job issues. And it's like, well, right now I'm between things, you know, like what do you, people mm-hmm. judge, right? They have the judgment yeah. of like, they're trying to categorize you and that's human nature to categorize and judge. It's just kind of normal to, to do that. But I think it's tough in, in, in society to figure out how to communicate. So that kind of goes back to your communication thing. I do, I'm going to come back to this in a second. I did want to point out in the U S you do have free healthcare if you're below the poverty line. Oh. And it's like actually comprehensive. You pay zero for therapy. Uh, you pay zero for hospitalization. You pay zero for whatever it, you have to be under a certain amount. And then if you have children, you, it minus is $10,000 or whatever off your income It's called Medicaid in most States. Mm. Um, now there are a few States that we're trying to not, to have it be limited, but that's a whole nother story between the states. We won't go there. Mm-hmm. But in uh, in most states, in the both states I have I live in, um, both of uh, the coverage is 100%, which is amazing. The hard part is to get that, you have to be poor. And so I've had people come to me with chronic illness, and this is the conversation we have. They go, oh my God, I could be getting a job promotion. And I'll be making, instead of 24000 which is barely getting by, I'll be making 50,000, but here's the problem. I'm on this expensive medication. And if I mm-hmm. take the company's health care, now the company pays what, 75%, 50% of my health care every month. They pay the premium, or maybe they pay the whole premium, but most companies pay like 70% of your premium. I pay 30%. So let's just say it's uh, 50 bucks a month or something. Nothing terrible, maybe 75. So the company sponsored health care, yay. But my deductible, which is the man I pay, out of pocket that's determined by whatever weird insane private insurance situation we have here in the u.s which is a whole nother podcast we won't get into is ten thousand dollars so until so until i reach ten thousand dollars i'm paying for like out of pocket most of my care 
So, or $5,000 or $2,000. The better your job, this is the ironic part, the better your job, probably the more money you have. Thus, and here's the fun part, you get awarded a nice small deductible. I have people I've met who have $250 deductibles, which means after they pay their doctor or their therapist $250, everything else is 100% covered or 50% covered or 80% covered, right? That's private insurance. So I have people come to me, I'm going to get this raise, $50,000, employee-sponsored healthcare. Here's the problem. I've done the math. My medication and my health care is costing so much money through the state run free health care that I have right now that if I take this job, I'm going to be paying out at least ten thousand dollars of my income right off the bat, possibly ap- after taxes, which is so so that brings me down to forty thousand dollars plus mm-hmm. all these premiums that's bringing me down you know and it's like all these factors and they're like you know, and certain things aren't covered. And then they start negotiating where the state will say, yeah, we're covering everything, whatever. I mean, you honestly get, I think we're service, but anyway, at least it's covered. So this is a conundrum for people that are chronically ill who are trying to get better. Now the systems inadvertently are saying, no, no, you cannot move up in society. You must stay poor Mm -hmm. and bedridden in order to qualify for this nice health care that you're getting through the U.S. Medicaid program. And that's before, yeah. that's not, that's without disability. That's just for being poor. You get that. So I, I, I was a little aside, but I think uh, the whole point of this is that it's complex to be a certain person with chronic illness, not only financially, health care wise, mm-hmm. family, work, identity, which you were going on about. Uh, about the identity and how like, oh, I can't work anymore. Who am I? I'm a lover of animals. I'm somebody. So I think what I'm hearing here is we live in a complex world and we've, and, and, and we aren't really taught these skills in school. I think to be, you have value as a person, just the way you are, you are uh, an individual and you don't have to produce something to be valuable. Right. And that I think that's a, that's a concept that is yeah. not really in the Western vocabulary. And we won't go into that podcast. That's a whole nother podcast. But but essentially you're helping people get in touch with what really is important, which is the values statement. Because when you go to the deathbed yeah. studies, people say, What do you wish you'd had done? Right. The top regrets of the dying and all that. I don't remember what all of it is, but a lot of it is the gist of it is spent more time with loved ones, uh, told my friends I love them, spent more time in my garden, spent more time with my animals, um, nicer to people, didn't care so much about money, didn't care so much about achievement. These are the sort of themes you get from people that are dying, you know, in the US, at least in in this book that I was reading. So I, I feel like what you're doing is you're going, okay, let's go to zero here. What are our values? Who are you? Right? Okay, let's start mm-hmm. there. <laughs> okay. Because and if that's you the first the, section of the book. Right. Oh, yeah. is it? Okay, because I was going to say, because if you let the chronic illness define you, then, oh, I'm a chronically ill person, you know, and I'm poor. And, yeah. oh, I, I'm a, a waste of time, you know, I can't even do anything anymore. I'm so I'm so depressed, right? So anyway, mm-hmm. let's talk about the positive, because yeah. I just went real negative. <laughs> no, that's, I mean, that's part of it, though, is like, you're right, is, And I hope this book, again, that's why I'm hoping it can be insightful for people who don't have chronic illness in that it sheds light on how complex living with chronic illness is. It's not just the physical. It's all these, like you say, the finance. I don't get into the financial and political aspects. Again, not my area of expertise at all. Um, But yeah, the first few sections of the book of the personal exploration and self-exploration is there's an exercise about values I give to so many of my clients when I start working with them. We need some sort of North Star here. And you're right. Productivity equals my value is a huge part of our kind of North American Western capitalist society. And when people feel like they can't contribute by having a job or working in the way that they want, or maybe even going to school or, or doing whatever it is because they have limitations due to their illness. Where is that value? And it kind of creates some existential crisis. Like, where's the meaning in life? What are we here for? And you know, I love what you were saying about people on their deathbed. It's like, exactly. It's finding value in these things. Um, 
being able to bring those into aspects of our identity, aspects of taking care of ourselves. So yeah, that personal exploration piece is there's a reason it's the first part of the workbook because that's again sets the foundation. Just having that introspection, being self-aware, getting some of these things. It's like you may kind of already be aware of these, but have you ever really articulated them, put them on a piece of paper, asked yourself these questions? That's kind of what the workbook is trying to do is just be like, Hey, you've got all these answers inside you already. I'm just going to pull them out and you're going to put them on a piece of paper and be like, Oh, interesting. And you can look back to that. And then we build on those things again in in some of the other sections where things get into emotional processing and, you know, social communication and things like that. So yeah, I think the identity is part of a job to, the question you were asking reminds me of those those minimalist guys. Um, oh yeah, they they often rather than asking someone, "Hey, what do you do?" They say, "What are you passionate about?" Right. That's kind of the question that they like to ask people. Um, trying not to define people again by what they do to earn money, but how they spend their free time, how they choose to spend their time, and I think that's a really great way of looking at things, especially for people with chronic illness of like, you know, the time and energy I do have, I'm free to spend that, you know, within my limitations, how I want and, and having that, um, as part of their identity. Yeah, that's lovely. I'm just going to repeat that for our listeners. I think we should all have a goal. I just said, (laughs) should, I know that we shouldn't Albert Ellis would be very (laughs) angry at me, but I'm going to say it. I would. How about this? Let's do a challenge. All of all the listeners, but for the next week, two or three people you talk to, ask them instead of, you know, what do you do? Say, what are you passionate about? I think that's a very good thing. I'd like to culturally push that. Um, I do. I did watch the minimalist documentary, and they have quite a cool blog and podcast as well. Um, there's lots of minimalist groups, but there's of course the minimalists, which was the first one that uh, Josh went, and Ryan, went, yeah, yeah. <laughs> went for the marketing ploy, and that, that's the minimalists. You'll find them on Netflix and wherever else. Um, but I think that's I think that's lovely because I, I think instinctively a lot of people. This is just a theory inside know that there's intrinsic value in themselves and others just for being people and that we can share things and that we can learn from each other and that we can express ourselves no matter what our limitations are, right? No matter what our chronic illnesses are. But then I think we have this cultural sort of like veil or covering or what do you want to call it that has been handed down to us. And that's really only been you know, the modern version is only probably 50 years old, maybe 70 years old, right? Of this sort of hyper-capitalist, what you produce and what you do and how you hustle your side hustle and you're this and your passive income and your four-hour work week and all this BS about getting rich quick and all this is is more important and more interesting, right? I mean, in the US, we Mm -hmm. I don't even watch television in the traditional way, but I guess no one does anymore. But I you know, like these, uh, you know, these shows we have in the U.S. are like, present your cool idea to these billionaires and they'll tell you how cool it is or they'll t- they'll make fun of it. Right. And, you know, and then you can like sell your cookies or hot sauce or whatever. And they'll, t- you know, they'll maybe they'll help you. Whatever. I don't know. There's like 10 shows. Yeah. like this. I don't even know. Right. And, and it's like, is that what we're talking? You know, is this like, is this interesting? I find it very boring. I'm like, I can learn from this. Okay, that's cool. I've learned how to make cookies and learn how to market. That's fun. But like, where is the, is this person, are you passionate about this hot sauce? Right? Is this what mm-hmm. you love? Because I, I, I go old school, you know, like Alan Watts, like follow your bliss. But he, what he meant was like, not just like follow whatever pleasure you find. If you read the entire book, he's talking about like following what you feel like your calling is and what makes you happy and what makes you excited inside. And if you do that, it may turn into a vocation. But if it doesn't, that's okay, right? Follow it anyway. And if you've got a chronic illness, I think it's important to have a passion or to have something, even if due to the chronic illness, you can't spend as much time doing it or even thinking about it due to the Mm -hmm. problems you've got. At least you've got something you like and that you're interested Mm -hmm. in. And, And I don't know. Everyone's got different things, right? Um, 
for instance, maybe you can't have horses because you have a chronic illness, but you could, you know, research horses and you could, you know, maybe you can hopefully read something in the internet or listen about horses, or maybe once in a while you could go see some horses. I don't, there's things you can do versus going, well, I, I'm just chronically ill, so I'll never get my dream of looking at horses. Like, I feel like it's just the hard part is how do we accept our limitations to be able to, to which the average person might be able to go take a, a subway ride or a car ride to a horse farm immediately where it might take you two weeks of planning. Right. I mean, yeah. And I think that's, that's circling back to acceptance versus giving up, right. Mm-hmm. Accepting the limitations and the hand we've been dealt and not just throwing our hands up in the air, which is really hard. It's way easier said than done. It's extremely unfair to be dealt the hand of having a chronic illness. And that's why at the back of the book, I'm, I'm playing around with these sections about validating that, you know, and because as much as I want this book to give people hope and optimism and new tools and things like it still sucks to go through. And being able to kind of hold that as well, right? Can we have both of these? It's like a lot of things that we're told it's unfair that we're given these things. And people with mental health issues, right? People who are more prone to addiction. A lot of people are given things they didn't ask for. They're very, very unfair. But it's still their responsibility to manage and deal with that as much as possible. And I talk to a lot of clients about that, the kind of balance between can we have compassion for ourselves or other people, but still have expectations as well. Well, This happens a lot with um, loved ones of of people struggling with addiction because it's, it's such a difficult thing to have in one's life. And it's, you know, you can understand that this person has a disease and that they're going through such a rough time and this isn't their fault, but also needing to have expectations and boundaries that this person isn't going to, you know, put you in situations that you're not okay with. And that can be, again, these really nuanced situations that come up with managing chronic illness as well from, you know, the friends and family members, loved ones of someone with chronic illness of what are their expectations? Again, can they have compassion that, Hey, this is not this person's fault. Like they didn't bring this on. You mentioned before too, like the, yeah, why, why is this come back? Like maybe I'm going through a flare and then say to my clients, we put on the detective hat, right? We want to be like, what happened? How can I control this? And that kind of puts us into this place where We've got two options. The first is that I was in control of this and I messed up and it's my fault. Or the second option is I didn't do anything and therefore am completely powerless to when this comes around. Both of those options are horrible, right? And very, very tough to process. And so can we, again, create some balance? This kind of reminds me of DBT, like dialectical behavior therapy, where we're able to hold two seemingly opposing ideas at the same time. And thinking about Venn diagrams, right? That piece in the middle, where do these things maybe overlap? Can we submit to the powerlessness and lack of control that chronic illness brings into our lives? But can we also then say, hey, there are some things I can control that I'm going to do my best to manage. So it's tough. Again, it's, it's a hard one, which is why I think we all have so many clients that uh, thankfully come to us. And I just absolutely adore all of my, all of my clients, all my chronically ill clients, um, you know, and just commend them so much for the hard work that they're doing coming to therapy and, yeah, hopefully this book can can help the ones that, you know, I don't get to see in session. Well, I think that's a very good mission. And I'm very glad you said that because I feel like it's a really good summary of how it is. And it's a threat to the way you have always lived before you had the chronic illness, but it is an opportunity to grow as a person. And I, I will say this, I, I wasn't going to say this, but I've decided to. My uncle had a chronic 
illness when he was alive. He had a traumatic brain injury because he got hit by a car that was going quite quickly, you know, and he had like a bunch of issues because of that. He had, he couldn't work, you know, he, he, his, uh, he was intelligent, but he had problems talking and, um, he was slowed down. He used to live with us for a while when I was a kid. And despite his limitations, he, uh, lived in a, like a, a, a home for people with disabilities. And, uh, you know, he, uh, but he started a garden and his garden got quite famous because they brought school kids there to like learn how to garden. He taught people the garden and he bred all these different, you know, types of tomatoes and all these things. And he would go to these different meetings that he was interested in, like our community meetings. And he would have to take a bus that would like help his, like, he had like a special, like, uh, bike and a special like wheelchair type thing he would sit in and he had to do all these things but uh people really liked him because Mm -hmm. he couldn't couldn't work right so he had extra time so he would talk to anybody who was having a problem so he was famous for at the at the group home these like troubled youth in their 20s would like come to the home be like i need to talk to kevin and they're like who are you like i met him at the bus stop i need to talk to him and he would talk to them for hours about you know, their life or their problem, whatever they're going through, because he was a good listener, even though he couldn't communicate as well. And I thought about that. And, and, and then when he passed away, you know, so many people just missed him so much and everyone, you know, this is kind of a family thing, but he was everyone's favorite because he wasn't judgy. I mean, every day he's struggling. He, it took him an hour to get dressed, you know, Mm -hmm. because he had like all these physical illness issues from the car hitting him. Um, you know, he, he took him an hour to get dressed. It took him forever to eat. It took him so long to get to the store to get anything. And he wanted to do it himself. But I thought about that. And I I think back on him and I, I say like, people like were devastated when he died because he was so friendly to everyone in the community that he was unforgettable while, you know, other great people have jobs running around. We're so busy, but they didn't have time for people they met at a bus stop. He didn't, they didn't have time to go to the community meetings. They didn't have time to make this community garden and have school kids, you know, and he had all this time and he gave it away in a, in a nice way to people. And I feel like that helped so many people, even though he was so ill that he couldn't take a normal job. So I, I mm-hmm. think that, is a reframe I kind of wanted to put on there is no matter how disabled or, or chronically ill you are, you know, you do have a gift and you don't have to produce a lot to, 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 to share your gift, right? Even if it's Mm -hmm. just being nice to the healthcare providers that are helping you, how many people are mean to the healthcare providers at the hospital because they're angry. They're angry about mm-hmm. being chronically ill. They're angry about a disease and they're angry. They're mean to the nurses and doctors, you know? So there is something you can do and that's the hard part. So I'm glad about this book. I'm glad about, you know, uh, you know, giving hope even in a situation that is fixed and, or unpredictable. Um, and I, I love the acceptance versus giving up. Cause I think that is the key, the key point there, uh, that you've, you've really nailed it. So, Yeah. Thank you. Comments. Yeah, well, this has been really great. I thank you so much for always insightful conversation. And mm-hmm. you know, I'll probably uh, listen back to this and, and make sure I've hit all these ideas in the book. And again, hopefully this book will be out by the end of 2023. Um, very busy these days, but this is, you know, becoming more and more my top priority because I think, again, I'm, I'm really hopeful that it can help a lot of people and just want to get this resource out uh to to the world as as quickly as possible so yeah i love it i i feel like uh we've we've hit on enough points that people are going to be interested to pick up this book and i know you're going to have it out there for a low cost and uh i'm going to be linking your website for your last book and also scintillatherapy.com which the spelling will be in the show notes and everywhere people can find you, Joel, if they have, uh, you Please. know, if they want to write in. Uh, and I'm excited Please, to, yeah. to uh, you know, provide this um, podcast to people because I do think there's a huge need out there for helping folks that are dealing with chronic illnesses. And I appreciate your vulnerability and sharing about your own. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Again, I think there is there is a need. I've done some research. I found some 
some books that are really great again about people's personal accounts with managing chronic illness and things but and i think uh being able to have an interactive workbook is something i have i've yet to see out there so and i'm i'm hoping that this will be something that people can pick up uh if they're wondering how they can find out when it's published I've been thinking about that prior to being on today and I don't really have a social media or anything like that. So the best way is to just, if you can see my old book on Amazon, I'll be under the same author name, of course. So you can just keep checking back on Amazon to see if I've published something else under the exact same name, which is J L Prevo. And that'll be the conversation guide. And that's on Amazon, all over different countries, um, Canada and the US for sure, and a huge handful of others. So that's probably the best way to check up on my progress. And I will try and get this out to people as quickly as possible. But like you said, please, if anyone has any questions, um, or if you live in British Columbia and want to become a client of mine, please reach out. Uh, But happy to talk to everybody else too uh, via email and answer what I can for sure. Yeah, I think there. I think that sounds like a great way, and I also think you can follow people on uh, Amazon. I'm hoping somebody puts you on Goodreads.com, which is my other favorite like book site. So if you're not on there, hopefully somebody will put you on there soon. But I think Amazon is. A I good am way on to, there. Oh, you are on there. Okay, so the conversation guide is okay. On there. So yeah. maybe just send it. Put in your search engine and the conversation guide. Because I was trying to find you by your last name, and I think there's a lot of people with your last name. Um, so I think that will be good. Uh, conservate conversation guide and then we'll go to goodreads that's and so then that you can i think you can also look uh sign up for updates that way great Uh, yeah i will make sure it's on goodreads then definitely so those are that's great and i really appreciate your your time today thank you so much i appreciate coming back and uh yeah maybe we'll get to chat again once the new book is out uh or some other time sounds good to me thanks joelle Keep calm and keep up the pace Keep calm but don't be late As sure as the sun will rise The machine keeps churning And there you have it. This has been another episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please share it with people you know. I would surely appreciate it. Or leave us a rating on iTunes as it really helps us get some notoriety. As some of you know already, myself and my colleagues are passionate about preventing future violence in the United States. We have started a nonprofit called the National Violence Prevention Hotline, which is a 501c3 organization. We are endeavoring to gain funding and collaborators that we can start a 24-7 hotline and chat line to reach potential perpetrators before they act violently. It is a bold effort to curb violence and save innocent lives by working to connect with potential offenders while they are in the planning stages of violence. Help to de-escalate them and provide resources so that they can get appropriate professional help wherever they live. The National Violence Prevention Hotline is looking to open up a conversation about violence in society, the causes, and the solutions. You can learn more by visiting our website, violencepreventionhotline.org. Join us by signing our petition, sharing the website with your network, donating to the cause, and now you can even write your congressperson from our website. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you are an independent therapist or a small group practice or even a large group practice and you have a billing company that you're not satisfied with, check out Therapist Billing Services. That's www.therapistbillingservicesllc.com. This is Therapist Billing Services created by therapists. If you are looking for an EMDR, International Association Consultant, I am now an EMDR, International Association Consultant, and I can provide 20 hours that you need to become EMDRIA certified. I have consultation groups both online and in person. Check out my website, healthforlifegr.com, and send me a message. If you want to get trained in EMDR therapy and are looking for some great advanced EMDR therapy trainings, check out EMDR Training Solutions and register today. They are now back to doing in-person trainings. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment with a local counselor in your area. 
You can also make an appointment with the excellent clinicians in the Grand Rapids area at Health for Life Counseling and the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids by visiting www.healthforlifegr.com. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guest, and while these are based upon the literature they have read and their experience in the respective fields, these should not be viewed as the definitive opinions on any subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you are in a crisis, please dial 911 right now or the National Suicide Crisis Hotline at 988. You can also text 741741 and a live trained crisis counselor will respond. You can support your local bookstore by shopping at www.bookshop.org. You can order online from the comfort of your own home while supporting local businesses near you. If you are a therapist and you are not a member of your local counseling or therapy association, please join. We have to make sure our industry is not turned into gig work. We have to make sure that people get quality mental health services wherever they live, and we need to be able to integrate them into schools and businesses and wherever else the needs are. All right. Until next time. I'm wishing you all a safe and peaceful week. Come on, let's go. You nothing to turn to now everything's changed. Come on, let's go. Stop looking for answers in everyone's gaze. Come on, let's go. What's the point in wasting time? On people that you never know Come on, let's go When you're looking for a friend But it's empty at the end When everybody disappears You won't be alone If you want to compensate If you overestimate So there'll be nothing left to fear You won't be alone You nothing to turn to now everything's changed Come on let's go Stop looking for answers in everyone's gaze Come on let's go What's the point in wasting time on people that you never know Come on let's go changed. Come on, let's go. Stop looking for answers in everyone's gaze. Come on, let's go. What's the point in wasting time on people that you'll never know? Come on, let's go.